Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. <coughs> Sunday chat today is going to waffle around the subject of uh, hope for the best, plan for the worst. <laughs> Age old saying. Fits into lots of things and unfortunately it fits into our orchids too. Um, things go wrong. Sometimes things go wrong and we don't know what it is and we never find out. More often than not, we do know what's gone wrong. And if we know what's gone wrong, why did we let it happen? But we do. We're all guilty of this in some shape or form. Me too. Let's start off with me, you know. Um, my worst offence, I suppose, which has been taking place over years and years. Now, at first I didn't know any better, but I flipping do now, is leaving plants in pots too long and letting the media start to break down and the roots deteriorate. You know, um, in some cases if you let that go on too long you lose your root system completely and then you've got a rescue plant and if you're lucky you might be able to grow some more roots. Um, so why, why did we do that? Now, in all these things to do with orchids, lifestyle comes into it. How much time can you put in and when? Now some people have a working week that's incredibly busy and they can only get at their orchids in any shape or form at weekends. Now, this time of year here, these orchids in the main would be okay if I could only tend them weekly. And that includes the mounts. Um, I mean, I've realised, came to the point last winter, I didn't say much about it then because I was still under the impression I was probably doing things a bit wrong and there may be some consequences that I haven't noticed yet. But, um, you know, I've always said, if you go for mounts, you will probably get some very good results, but you have got to keep up with them. You've got to <coughs> be able to keep up with the maintenance. And what I mean by that is the watering, which in the growing season, you've got the long days, you've probably got heat, yeah? and mounts will not survive too long after they've gone dry. And at that time of year in here, they go dry in a day. The only ones that don't are the ones that are heavy on the moss. And some of that is planned. Um, recently I've started pot uh, potting, mounting a lot of oncidium types. And they seem to grow quite well. That's I picked that one up because that's the first of the twinkles I think that's actually going to bloom because the buds are the biggest, basically. And that's not a true twinkle anyway. It's a twinkle cross back with a sotoannum. Um, but, you know, this hasn't been watered for two days. It's dry. I don't care. I'm not watering today. I'm watering tomorrow. Now, this could be deemed a mistake. But... I'm just looking round, I don't see any plants failing, I don't th see things shriveling, I don't see roots dying. So is it a mistake? Now this, don't forget, I'm talking this time of year, you know, we're actually just below 20 degrees and nearly 90% humidity in here at the moment. And um, Hurricane Hector's been shut down till the spring now, so I'm not adding humidity in here. There's more than enough. You know, things that drip on the floor, wet pots, evaporating moisture, the plants themselves are giving off moisture. I'm trying to keep this place drier at the moment because if it's uh, currently just under 20 degrees and heading up towards 90%, tonight the temperature in here will go down to 15. So that's going to take it up to nearly 100%. Nearly 100%. Now up there on the bubble wrap, it's wet through. It's been dripping on the plants where there's so much humidity in here. I need to dry this out, which is why this door at the moment is staying open during the day. I'm trying to get some dryness out here. Adding humidity back in is easy. Getting rid of it's not. Not when you've got low temperatures and a shed load of plants give it off moisture all the time. So um, yeah, things we do wrong. I know some people, including me, oh, since I started putting those types of plants on mounts, they're doing so much better. That doesn't mean it was wrong when they were in the pots. There's something else afoot. It wasn't the fact they were in a pot that was wrong. It was what else was going on. It could have been the wrong media type. 
You know, I mean, that's another thing you can do. <clears throat> if you've got a lifestyle that doesn't give you time with your orchids, except at weekends like that, then you need a media that holds moisture a lot longer than what I would choose. Because I am around, yeah? And I prefer plants to head towards dryness relatively quickly and then I push them back up again, rather than them holding the moisture for a really long time. Some plants like it. And the downside is if you grow a lot that needs to stay moist all the time, unless you use an inorganic media, your media is going to break down faster than mine. Yeah? <laughs> but mine might get watered more often than yours, but it's the fact that it's in some cases gone bone dry and in other cases heading that way. So mine won't break down as fast because it's not staying wet long enough to do the damage, to actually cause that breakdown. Um, that happens. So again the lifestyle comes in. You can't correct your lifestyle can you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> This is what it is. All you can do is plan for the types of orchids that are going to put up with it in the main and choose media wisely so that you know they're not going dry for any long periods of time. That you can choose to do. Um, so Mistakes. Um, leaving plants in pots too long. How do you get around that? Ah, that's easy. <laughs> it's not going to stay in the pot too long if it's on one of them, is it? Yeah? Now, eventually, a, a mount can go wrong. Um, I've got one in here now that needs dealing with, but I'm not going to do it till the spring. Bark, cork bark, will eventually go down it will break down. And unfortunately, the place it breaks down is the bit you can't see. So I'm just, I'm just picking these at random. Um, I don't want to pick a new one because I... Um... See, what you've got here is some bark showing. This isn't cork bark in actual fact. And then a lot that's under the moss where most of the roots are. You can't see that bit, can you? Which bit's going to stay wet longest? It's the bit that's under there, isn't it? So which bit of the bark is going to rot first? The bit you can't see. How do you know then, apart from taking it off and damaging all your roots? Well, you, you get a feel for it. And in my case, I've noticed that as bark starts to break down, because I pour my water into a bowl, I can see it, yeah? It'll get bits in it. And you sort of think, where are all those bits coming from? Now occasionally it can be that you've got some munchers in under your root system and the guilty parties can often be those wood lice or pill bugs I think they're called in some countries. They feed on decay and stuff. They don't really damage your orchids to any great extent but they'll chomp up things under there and then when you water it all those bits come out. Yeah? But if they can chomp on it it's in a poor state because they only live on decaying matter. Yeah? So the very fact they're there means your bark's on the way out. But it can take quite a long time. Uh, something can stay on a mount many, many years, um, providing it's a suitable wood or bark. And um, things do well. And the reason they're doing well a lot of the time over and above the pots is because they're not getting disturbed. And this is the thing that we do that doesn't happen to the plants in the wild. There's plants that are renowned for being an absolute pain for root disturbance. Yeah? You've only got to look at the flipping roots and they start to die. So you've got to go incredibly careful with them. Well, why, why, don't, why doesn't that happen in the wild? Well, because they don't get their roots disturbed, do they? And there are some orchids that have evolved in such a way that they're very slow rooters. They don't grow roots very often because they don't need to. They've got a set of roots that hold them in place. They don't need another set. Yeah? So they expect their roots to live long and prosper. <laughs> All that stuff. Um, oh, that was left-handed as well. I didn't know I could do that. Um, yeah, so they expect to live long and prosper. They don't expect their roots to get damaged or get pulled off. Yeah? So they, they last well. So I still say that most things go wrong with orchids below the base of the plant. Yeah? It's the root system. It's what they're in. It's, it's, it's your watering frequency, um, how often you feed, 
how strong your feed is. Um, there aren't many orchids that feed so high that you're going to overfeed if you, you're going to push too much in there. Most of them are light feeders. Generally speaking, orchids don't need a lot of food. Um, but again, going back to the wild, that's like one of those uh, little flies, two, um, one, <laughs> um, is that they get rained on. And when they get rained on, they get some feed. It's a very light dose, but they get some each time it rains. And in a lot of places where the orchids grow, it rains every day, sometimes more than once. So they get some food very frequently, but they don't get much. And I like that idea. A little bit and often just works well in my head. It's also very easy to do. Um, it also, I've got a benefit there because the um, MSU feed that I use use the sort of strength I'm using I add it to my water and I religiously get the TDS meter out but what's that that's 150 155 yeah that'd be okay for this one put that away I get the pH meter out I don't know why because I know what the pH is going to be <laughs> and it's usually about 6.5 6.6 no, I don't bother adjusting it I just leave it be um, if at any particular time I want a lower pH, which I do want now and again, I just put a bit of seaweed in with the feed. That does it. <laughs> <laughs> mayday, mayday. That drops the pH like a flipping stone, that um, seaweed extract stuff. And I do use it, and I use it occasionally. But it's a beautiful thing to actually add to your feed to have a low pH now and again. I don't bother too much with the low pH simply because I know <clears throat> the pH is going to drop after the orchid's got it, yeah? So, the, I've still got some pots with some moss in. My mounts have got moss on. Moss is naturally pretty acidic. So, if you put a feed in at a pH of 7, and then came back and put some clean water on it and measured the runoff the next day, it'll probably be down quite low because of the moss. Moss will naturally lower it. So will bark unless it's brand new. Brand new bark shouldn't change the pH much, but it doesn't stay brand new, does it? You know, after six months it's not brand new anymore and it will be slowly but surely starting to break down a bit and as it does so it will become more acidic and it will lower the pH in the pot or on the mount if it's moss on the mount. So I don't bother with a low pH very often because the plants are going to get it anyway. They're going to get it naturally. So when they get like now, let's say these, these mounts are dry, yeah? So if I put a feed on now, it would go in at a pH of around probably 6.5, 6.6. And the roots are dry. So the first thing they're going to do is take on board moisture with some feed, yeah? And the elements that they will take on board are those that are easily absorbed at that pH. Now a couple of elements might not get absorbed very well at that pH, but it's not going to be dry in a couple of hours, is it? But what's been soaked up into those roots, you'd be surprised how quickly that starts to move up in and around the plant. <coughs> well, the roots will grab hold of some more, won't they? And what's happened since that first dose on those dry roots? The pH has dropped. So the elements that didn't go in the first time round I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in like as though there's a slot there and a slot there. It's a gradual process, yeah? But there will come a point before the roots are totally dry that there is a lower pH and elements can be absorbed that are more suited to a lower pH. It, it just sort of works. Just balance it, itself out. Nobody goes around adjusting the pH in the wild, do they? <laughs> they get what they're given. Same with the amount of food. And the elements within that food, they get what they're given. So, uh, don't worry about it too much. So, hope for the best. Think about what is the best. Can you do the best? Here's an exercise for you. It's difficult to do in a large collection. Well, do it, do it a section at a time. Like, let's say, right, I'm going to take that shelf today. And I'm going to look at every single plant and really look at it and really think, am I doing the best for that plant? And if not, why not? What's not quite right? 
And am I going to turn around and walk away? Probably, unless it's well out of order. And this is where it creeps in. It's us. It's not the orchid's fault, it's us. So if I went round there, I've got a um, Phalaenopsis type dendrobium at the, at the back there. That hasn't been repotted too long ago, um, but it's a while ago. That will need doing next year. Yeah, but again, I'll wait for new growth, new roots. It's not urgent. No, that's that one. Next to that one is a big um, what you call it? Uh, it's my prima donna. So uh, uh, <coughs> I'll get there in a minute. Coffee. Nobly type dendrobium. There it is. I knew it was in there somewhere. It's all in there somewhere. It's getting it out. Um, now that has been in its pot quite a while. It's quite a small pot. So it gets watered frequently. So the media's going. It's not gone. And what's happening to a nobly from now for the next two or three months? Is it going to stay wet too long? <laughs> Doubt it, because it ain't going to get wet very often at all. So it can put up with that media yet again till the spring. So that's two. Next to that is a brassia. Mistake. It's a vigorous brassia and it's a brassia that I might be able to get out. Because this is a point I'd like to make because this is typical of brassias and a fair few of the oncidium types that are larger plants. Right, so I'm not getting lots of plants out. Pretty good root system. It's quite a large pot. What's wrong with it though? What is wrong with this plant? It's climbing. This new growth here, which is pushing on nicely, will produce some roots at some point and they'll go straight down in the pot. We like that. That one won't. Most of the roots on this growth are missing the pot, so the next one's certainly going to miss it. It could do with sorting out, but I'm not going to do it. So I take the risk. It's my risk, it's my plant. But this was deliberately planted and pushed back, yeah? But I couldn't do it for both leads. So you then have a decision. If you know it's going to get out of the pot, well, put it in a wider pot then. Yeah, well, the trouble is when you go wide with the pots, you tend to go deep as well. Well, we know how to turn a deep pot into a shallow pot, don't we? We crock it. And you can crock it heavily if you really do want a shallower pot, and the pot's far too big. You know, I mean, a suitable width pot for this plant would be that wide. Well, it's going to be down here, isn't it? It's a huge volume of media. It'll stay wet too long, because it won't have a sufficient root system to deal with it. So a third of the pot we can fill up with those polystyrene chips. The trouble is with those flipping things, they've got no weight and your pot will topple over. Well, chuck some rocks in as well then. You know, there's ways of dealing with it. But this, unfortunately, is going to need dealing with before the media starts to break down. So this is going to need a repot for, the, for a different reason, not because the media is old and tired, it's because it's been potted wrong. The best thing I could have done with that was split it into two plants and mount them. And then it would have grown off the mount and I'd have had aerial roots. Now I've done this enough times, I know that would happen. Maybe not with the next growth, but the one after, it likes to just get away. So it stays in the pot and it's a half and half. It may not do quite as well as it should do. Whoops! <laughs> Dunk the leaf in your coffee, why don't you? Oh, that's hot. <laughs> Makes a change for my coffee to still be hot. Right, so we've got to that one, and that plant's got a problem. But I can't deal with it. Yeah? Now, I could repot that now and do what I just said and put it in a much wider, deeper pot, crocked at the bottom, and... Um, and the next set of roots that come out on both of those leads would get down in the pot. What about the next two? I can't have a pot that flipping wide, can I? So it's going to have to get split, eventually, but not now. And what else we've got? We've got another nobly there. Um, that's a massive plant. The media in there is fine. That will stay in there well into next year when the new growths push on. Um, we've got a large oncidium type there. 
that needs repotting first thing in the spring, first chance I get. It's currently pushing out half a dozen spikes or so. It'll be in bloom in two, three weeks maybe. They don't last a huge amount of time. It's Tahitian dancer, so it's a Soto Annum cross basically. Um, but um, the roots in that media, all across the top of the pot have died. And they've died because they stayed dry too long. Yeah? Me. Yeah? And the Soto Annum is the one thing that I've got wrong and I should know better. Um, the pieces that are recovering, we do have new roots growing now. I will get a good root system back on these plants. Um, they've got plenty of room to grow. New growths are here. Yeah? They've got all that width of the pot to grow into. Yeah? The roots that I've got over this side are from this previous new growth. Immature, did not get up to full size. So, oh dear, it only managed to push up two spikes. <laughs> but it's now growing roots, has an active root system, and it has new growths pushing on that will produce even more. <sighs> Come May next year, that pot will be full of roots. And it will be in active growth because there will be more new growths to come on the bulbs that are currently blooming. As soon as they finish they'll start. So I'll probably end up with four, maybe even five new growths on that plant. That's a lot. What's it going to need while it's in that rate of growth? Being a vigorous plant? It needs watering more often than my normal frequency. That's what took it down. For once, not too much water, not enough. And I think that's the first orchid I've ever had that I've virtually lost through lack of water. It just caught me out, the, the sheer speed at which it was drying out. And it's got a very fine root system. A lot of the other types of Oncidium, certainly a lot of the intergenerics, they've got quite fleshy root systems. And they will stand being dry a while. But the Soto Annum didn't like it at all. The Tahitian dancers in the same boat, it's heavy on the Soto Annum. So uh, again, there is some root loss in there. And where it has to stay wet so long, and it's a fine root system, it's got a lot of fine bark in the pot. It's going to break down faster than the big stuff. That's just, I don't know whether that's typical of all bark or whether it's just the Orchiata stuff. But the small grade Orchiata bark breaks down fast. There's, there's no last, last three or four years. Cobblers, I'd say annually, 18 months at the most with the small stuff. The medium stuff's not bad at all. The large stuff does last. Yeah. Right, so where do we get to? More coffee. Let me just have a quick look at the time up here. Where are we? Where's the time bit up there? 23. Right, we've now got this one. Why is this in a broken pot, I ask you? It's because this, which lives up here, fell on it, knocked it off the shelf onto the floor and broke the pot. Naughty. And do you know why that fell off? Because I was not concentrating when I put it back up there where it lives and the hook missed so as I let go it just fell straight down straight on top of that it didn't break any new growths but it did break one leaf off of that new growth so we lost a leaf there on a new growth but it didn't damage anything luckily not to any extent I was very surprised but apart from the pot and I thought <coughs> does it matter that it's in a cracked pot no it doesn't matter <laughs> If it was on a mount, it, you know, that amount of root would be showing anyway. This has got a big rock in the bottom of this, or, and it's a clay pot with holes in. It's probably the most of my, amount of air I could get round there. That's a Latoria type Dendrobium. It hasn't long been put in that pot. It's going to survive the winter very, very well, because it's going to stop growing. It's going to object to the cold and the short days by ceasing growth. Is it going to stay too wet like in previous years? Hell no. <laughs> One day, I can soak that, which was the plan. I can give that a really good watering. Day, two days max, that will be dried out because of the sheer amount of air. 
So that can now survive the winter successfully, whereas how it was potted before it wouldn't. This is a bit iffy, this one. This is the, um, the Thailand black that I got quite recently. This hasn't got new roots growing and it hasn't got a very good root system. And without a very good root system, when you water it, it's staying wet too long. So, it's going to have to be watered a lot less frequently. And when I water it, trickle. Trickle around the outside of the pot, not soak it. I soaked it this time because it's new bark and I needed it wet and wash the dust out. That's why it's just had a good soak. So that's that. That will probably do okay, but it's in survival mode for the winter and it was deliberately potted with charcoal in the mix, which should stop the media going off so fast. So in theory, it can stay in that pot for some time. Now this thing was a gift. This was from Zena. Not quite sure why. I don't grow Phalaenopsis, do I? But it's a species, it's Violacea, which does have a beautiful bloom. Comes into the same category as the Victoria Regina. It's difficult to get the colour right on film. But it was a leaf with a couple of roots. <laughs> um, we do have some root growth, believe it or not, on my single leaf Violacea. It's going to be years before that's big enough to bloom, if it ever does. But it has started a new leaf. So it will be a two leaf. It's, oh, it's a seedling basically, so. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll look after it, I'll keep it going. It's in fine bark. And this is in the bark from, um, looks the same as the stuff from Burn as I got from Burnham's. It's a different color to the Orchiata. It's a much, much more golden color. And quite honestly, I like the look of it, I really do. Whether it's any good or last for ages, I don't know, but I like the look of it. Um, so things that can go wrong. Um, root loss, big deal. Um, and yes, you will get some if you don't get a suitable media for the plant in question and the type of roots it's got. So I'm just putting my plants back. Um, and that is quite important, media choice. Um, not just what sort of media, but what size, especially if you're talking bark. The size of the media is quite important. Very fine root systems are more likely to want a finer medium to grow in. That's not always the case. I'll give you an exception. Exception to the rule. Tolumnia. Very, very fine root system. <laughs> Put that in a pot full of fine bark, you'll probably end up with no roots quite quickly. Um, they're twig epiphytes. They, they grow masses of roots, but it's a very fine root system. And they don't like being buried in things. They just like to ramble openly. Um, they'll grow on nothing, in nothing. And they do very well mounted because you can never overwater a mount. It's not possible. Yeah? In the summertime, I water that. Three hours, it's dry. And that suits that plant. Suits it fine. Yeah. In theory, it would probably benefit from getting watered twice a day in the real heat of the summer. But, I mean, this is how a nursery is growing to Lumnias. It's just a little open plastic basket. The roots go all over the place. They're quite happy, you know. And that hasn't been watered for two days. And it's going another day before it gets watered. But it is in high humidity. I don't think I'd get away with my watering schedule if I didn't have that humidity. I'd probably um, be starting to get some shriveling on the plants. Um, yeah, so a lot of the things that go wrong with the orchids are things we know about. They're not things we don't know about. You know, we, we, we do know that, you know, if our orchid has gone completely dry and it's in active growth, it's not going to do it much good. It needs the water. So providing we can give it the water because we're there and not out at work for the whole week, it's our problem to deal with. If you've picked up your plant to water it because it's Saturday and it's the only day of the week you can water your plants and it's still wet from the week before, you've got two choices. Water it again, soggy. 
leave it out and it's going to have to wait a week. That will do it far less harm. Far less harm. Far more roots go down for being wet and soggy, especially in cooler temperatures and short days, than ever will go wrong from not having enough water. They're very tolerant. That's what the bulbs and the canes are for. They're storage organs. So they can cope with some dryness. Some of them don't like it as much as others put up with it. None of them like it as such for any length of time. But you like the Cattleyas, wet dry cycle. Daily wet dry cycle in the growing season, perfect. Water them on day one, water them again in the morning on day two because they're totally dry. They're not going to do that in the winter in here. My holy clay pots are staying wet for two to three days now. So their watering cycle is six or seven days. So wet for three, dry for three. They're not growing much. It's cold. It's, it, temperatures have dropped. Day lengths right down. So adjust your mechanics, your maintenance routines for the season and try and accommodate the orchids with the problems you know are there and try and get around them somehow. Um, so like I said, I mean, it's um, when I was working, I used to be up at five o'clock in the morning to water my plants on a weekday because they couldn't wait till the weekend. <clears throat> and I still enjoyed it. <laughs> but then I'm one of those who don't mind getting up early. I do it naturally. Um, try some experiments. You know, I mean, zygopetalums, get one, kill it, get one, kill it, get one, kill it. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you will get the same results. So what was the thing I was doing over and over again? It was repotting because the media was getting old and tired and starting to break down. Too late for those plants. Sensitive root systems, same with the Miltoniopsis. Don't wait till it's on the way out. Get it before. Get in there. Get it done. Do less harm with the repot getting rid of that media and putting it in fresh than you will possibly even waiting for a new growth and new, some new roots. That could be just too long and you'll lose more of the older ones waiting to get the timing right. So sometimes you have to override that timing. I always say, you know, the best time is when there's new roots growing and it always will be. But sometimes you just have to go early otherwise you do more damage than good. So. It helps to understand the things that can go wrong. Ask yourself, are they going wrong? And if they are, can you do something about it now? Should you have done something about it earlier? If so, don't get in that position again. Yeah? I mean, I'm still doing it. I've, I've got probably got half a dozen plants in here that if I picked them up, I'd sort of go, God, that media's getting old and tired. That needs repotting. Well, it did last time and the time before I watered it, and it's still not been done. So I'm still guilty of doing that. But this time of year it does less harm because it don't get watered much. I watered my ordinary pots, so that's not the holy clay pots, and not the cooler, shadier ones. It's everything else that's in a pot uh, about two days ago. It was nine days since they'd seen any water, and some of them got put back because they were still wet. So my frequency of watering has gone right down now. I love it. I have whole days where I don't have to water anything. <laughs> and I walk up and down in the lounge thinking, what are we going to do now? What am I going to do now? <laughs> I'd rather have something to water, I think. Right. Um, the, uh, this is just waffling around a subject. Things will go wrong, yeah? You hope they won't, but they will. And they will go on, go on going wrong if you keep letting them go wrong. So your objective is to start to get to know the plants, get to know the sort of things that can go wrong depending on your media type, your watering frequency. Because you can have a plant in small bark there and another one in small bark there and the media is going off in that one and it's not in that one and they were both repotted at the same time. Why? Because that one gets watered more often. Why? Because the roots are using it up faster. Because this one stays wet longer. It's a slower growing plant. Yeah? But you need to know that. 
Um, those are things you can't necessarily plan for when you first get the plant. You have to wait until you get to know these things. And if you haven't got a good memory and things don't sink in, and, or, or they go in and they don't stay there, write it down. Make notes. <laughs> either electronically or if you want, get a pencil and flipping notepad, you know, we flip up pages, make some notes that you can refer to. Um, or video clips and store those away. You know, you've got a visual record then as well. Or if you haven't got the ability to do that, take some photos on your phone, file them away in folders. March, yeah? And take a picture of all your plants. April, take a picture of all your plants. It's a visual record, you'll see their progress or not. And if you don't see any progress two or three months on the trot, highlight it, trigger it up here and think, I need to look into this. This plant's not growing. Why not? Look into it. Don't just like I say, keep doing the same thing over and over again. The same thing's going to happen. Um, so like going back to the zygos, you know, buy one, blooms, repot, die, repeat, repeat. Well, I've stopped the cycle. I'm not doing the same thing. This time the repot was quite different. Different media, a different style, um, different attitude to the roots in handling. So quite a different repot this time round. We may still get the same result and it's brown bread in a few weeks time and all the roots die. You never know. But it stands a better chance than it has done in the past because I've done something different. Yeah. You got a plant that <clears throat> you repotted it several times in its life with you and it never seems to grow very well. Well, change it. Change the media. Change the size of the pot. Change the depth that you plant it in the pot. Yeah, so perhaps have shallower media in the same size pot or go for a small. Change something. Just there are many options of what you can change. Um, given your lifestyle and how frequently you can deal with your plants. But uh, that's the goal is to, you know, I mean, I've just gone through a shelf there. It didn't take long at all. Okay, I know my plants quite well. And, um, and I, a fair bit of that I did without even lifting them up and looking at the root systems. Because I did that last time I watered them. So I know what the root system looks like. Uh, my memory's not that far gone yet. <laughs> <coughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I've got half a dozen plants in here that need repotting. They are going to wait for the spring because they won't get much water from now on because everything's slowed down. Now, what about if you don't grow in an environment like this, you grow in your home? Well, you've just over the last month or so possibly had a major change in your home that you might not have noticed, but I bet your plants did. You turned the heating on because it's been flipping cold. That's a major change to your plants. You're not only raising your possibly early morning temperatures before it gets light so that it's nice and cosy when you get out of bed, when you get your lazy A out of bed and start moving around. Um, your plants may have already had quite a rise in temperature. It's not even daylight yet. That doesn't do them a lot of good. <laughs> it really doesn't. That's like, what's going on? It shouldn't be warm. It's supposed to be nighttime. It's cold at night gets warm when it gets light and the sun comes up. That's nature's way. We mess it up. What else does your heating do? Dries your air out so you're losing your humidity. So you've just changed your whole environment that your plants are in if you're growing in the home. So perhaps you should think about compensating to a degree. Well the first thing you can help is with is humidity. Get some trays, you know, with some gravel or something in with some water. Try and get some humidity into the air. Um, and depending on the temperature in your home, if you're one of these that, you know, is up like 23, 24 degrees during the daytime, you can spray your plants in the morning. It might pay you to have a little fan to get a bit of air movement as well. But that'll raise the humidity. As long, as long as they don't go into a cold night, damp and wet and water in the crowns, that'll raise the humidity. I mean, I don't get my plants wet. I don't like getting my plants wet, but that's me and it's out here. My air's wet enough out here. Yeah. But uh, the other thing that will have changed in your home is you've probably got a lot less light than you have had coming in through your windows. A lot less shorter days and, you know, duller days and all that sort of stuff. 
but when you do get some sun in your window it almost comes straight in and goes right through the room and up to the other end. So you've got things set back from the window that are now in full sun. <laughs> it's weak sun, don't panic. <laughs> but yeah, watch out for natural changes and think, are they doing any harm or are they doing good? If they're doing good, well, let's have a bit more then. You know, move some plants to, to take advantage of some extra light, things like that. But most of the things that go wrong with our orchids we already know. And this is the thing that I find astonishing, both with myself and everybody else. If we know the things that can go wrong, in advance of them going wrong, why do we let them go wrong? Get in ahead. Try and get ahead. And if you do it across the board, in, over time, you'll be ahead of everything and it'll, it'll sink in of how to do it. How to be on top of repotting. How to be on top of mounts breaking down, how to be on top of seasonal changes, like, um, I forget who it was, I was watching the video this morning, scrubbing the roof of the greenhouse to get all the algae off, to let more light in, because there's so little around in the UK, every bit counts. Now, I could get up and scrub the big lumps of moss and the algae off of the roof up here. I suspect if I did that, I'd be down here on the floor because <laughs> the roof wouldn't take my weight. No, I'm not too heavy. Well, actually, yes, I am. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I'm not getting up on that roof. It's not, it's, I've got no guarantee it would hold my weight. It's, this is a good, strong beam here. That's a cracker. But I'm not sure about that little one that goes across there because of what it's resting on. And that one along there. What it's resting on is not strong. So I'm not getting on that roof. <laughs> I could get a long handled brush and give it a scrub. And a word of warning, if you do get up scrubbing your roof and everything, if it goes in the gutter and in your rain barrel and you use it on your orchids, watch what you clean your roof with. You get up there with bleach and detergents, getting all the algae off and it's straight in your rain barrel, that's not going to do it any good at all. Disconnect, you know, let it go on the ground or something. So, uh, yeah. We're all on the change, seasonal changes are going to happen. We can't stop them out there, but we should know they're coming. So get into a system of where you're, you're ahead of the game, that's all I can say. Right, um, that'll do. Tomorrow will be the Everything in Bloom on the 8th. I know it's the 9th, but this seemed to be the best way to do it. Like that, I've got a, my first official committee meeting on Wednesday, Zoom meeting obviously, so it's not a proper meeting, but um, that's in the evening, that doesn't affect anything. Um, find out what my duties are on top of what I've already got allocated. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, and before I forget, today's tasteless joke, um, I think some people are getting a little bit worried about how far I'll go. Somebody will tell me if I go too far, I'm sure, and I, I know where the line is, yeah, I know where the line is, um, and there are certain subjects I won't touch, even though they're very popular in the tasteless jokes front. I'm not going down some roads, uh, because it is, too, as far as I'm concerned, it's offensive, not to me, but to others, so. Right, today's tasteless joke. Apparently, there's over a million obese children in this country, in the UK. That is a frightening thought. A million children are obese. It is also said that if they all jump up and down at the same time, they might lose some weight. See you next time.